Now I work with social insects and many of you probably think of the paradigm social insect as something like a honeybee colony. We have a single queen and many thousands of workers toiling on her behalf. Uh, or ant societies, large ant societies, which have essentially the same structure. And you probably don't realize that there are many other insect societies that are much smaller in size and in which the workers actually have a shot at reproduction. In honeybee societies and most ant societies, the workers have real no chance to ever produce offspring over their lifetimes. And that's a key to understanding why the, the entire colony seems to be a harmonious whole. Everybody's working towards the same reproductive goal. But that's not the case for these smaller insect societies, in particular the social wasp that I study, where the workers, yes, help the queen, who's their mom typically, but they also have a chance to reproduce on their own. They can supersede the queen. They can take over the queen position and lay eggs that produce both males and females. Uh, they can leave the colony and go adopt another colony or start one from scratch, or even go into uh, early hibernation to emerge next year as a full-fledged queen. So the workers have lots of incentives for being selfish in a wasp society, and that's why I'm interested in them. How do they balance the degree of selfishness and cooperation within these societies? And in particular, I'm interested in a wasp that probably can be found on the eaves of buildings wherever you live, because they're a cosmopolitan in distribution. They're called paper wasps of the genus Polistes. These paper wasps build paper nests, as the name suggests, and they like to nest in these enclosures, uh, which these eaves represent, uh, that are open to the air so that foraging can take place, but they're also protected from the elements. Underneath this eave is a paper nest with a colony of about 12 wasps that are actively foraging and uh, taking care of the brood and laying eggs, much like you see in the larger insect societies. But in these small groups, as I said, the workers have a shot at personal reproduction. Therefore, their genetic interests, their evolutionary interests, are not completely overlapping with those of the queen. And that means that they have a temptation to be selfish as well as to help the queen out. I'm interested in what governs the balance between this cooperation and potential conflict within these societies. Well, the beautiful feature of these nests is that they're not covered with an envelope, yellow jacket nest, for example. So you can actually see what the individuals are doing at any moment. You can see the cells containing eggs and larvae and pupae that they're tending to. So what we like to do is mark the wasp with little bits of paint, testers enamel paint, uh, for individual identification. And this is key to figure out what individuals are doing. Since we're interested in the potential for conflict when these, within these societies, we know, want to know how individuals are behaving in ways that might increase their individual reproductive interests at the expense of those of other individuals. So we need to mark individuals to tell them apart. And then we began, begin to unravel the soap opera by seeing, for example, which individuals are dominant over whom. Uh, there's a dominance hierarchy in the societies with the alpha or the top uh, level position being occupied by a female that dominates the lower ones. The second ranked or beta female dominates the ones below her in the dominance hierarchy and so forth. And you can work out the hierarchy actually within a few minutes by looking at uh, in specific interactions among them called mountings where one wasp will come over to another, the dominant wasp, will beat on the subordinate wasp with its antennae while the subordinate cowers and flies flat close to the nest and the subordinate wasps will remain motionless. Within minutes, you can work out who's alpha, who's beta, who's gamma, who's delta, and so on, down the entire uh, dominance hierarchy. Now that we know the dominance hierarchy, we can start to look at how individuals uh, behave in ways as to maximize their reproductive output. For example, we can look at what percentage of the time they spend foraging. Foraging is very risky in wasps. They go out and collect caterpillars to feed the larvae and the larval cells. Uh, but while they're out, they're at risk of being predated upon by birds and spiders and a variety of vermin that reduce their chances of making it uh, to the next day. And in fact, we know that foragers 
uh, live much less longer than do the dominant individuals, the queens, that spend most of their time on the nest taking care of brood. Let me say something about one of the specific ideas about the balance of cooperation and conflict that we're testing today in the field uh, as we speak. It turns out that game theory, which is an important theoretical framework for understanding how the balance of cooperation and conflict should evolve, game theory predicts that as groups get larger, individuals within those groups will tend to get lazier and lazier because they are in effect parasitizing the work efforts of everyone else. But what's interesting is that our models indicate that as the group size gets bigger, the rate at which laziness increases is going to be lower the higher the relatedness among group members. That is, the more closely related you are, the more overlapping are on your, your genetic interests. And so you don't become as lazy quite as fast as the group size increases. So um, uh, the set of experiments I'm doing at the moment, uh, I'm looking at um, what happens to workers when it appears to everyone else on the nest that they've been cheating by not investing in cooperation. So what I've been doing is catching wasps, catching workers um, as they leave the nest or come back from foraging trips and keeping, in the, keeping them in the lab for different amounts of time, so up to two hours or so, um, and comparing that with wasps that I, uh, that I catch, uh, mark them and then immediately return to the nest. Um, and half of them that I bring back to the lab, I give them a honey water mixture. So um, when they come back to the nest, um, they'll, they'll be well fed and they can then regurgitate that food and give it to their nest mates. And then when I release them, I take two hours of, of video recordings and I'm going to look at how they're treated by their nest mates when they return. Yes. So if wasps that have been off the nest for much longer than their usual foraging trip come and come back go. without food, are punished by the other workers or punished by the queen when they return. These societies are actually much closer in structure to human societies than most of the other insect societies we're interested in, and in that in human societies there's often a precarious balance between cooperation and conflict. The members have their own reproductive interests that sometimes are expressed at the expense of the group, the total group welfare. That's the same thing that's going on in these social wasps. So if we can understand the rules that govern the balance between cooperation and conflict in social wasps, we may gain some truly pivotal insights into how the balance of cooperation and conflict is regulated in human societies and can predict when conflict will reign over cooperation and vice versa.